I tell you, God has laid a message on my, on my heart. Haley, I'm missing a page. Will you bring it to me, please? I'll try not to keep you over an hour, hour and a half. No, I'm just teasing. Honestly, I am. But about a little over, no, not that. Yeah, it's there. Okay, thank you. Uh, about, it's been a little over a month ago, God put a message on my heart, and this is how he told me to dress. And I'm like, Lord, Pastor Gary will not ask me to preach again. But, you know, I'd rather obey God than man. And, I, of course, some of y'all have seen some of my outfits I wear when we do kids' moment up here, so this shouldn't shock too many of y'all. But, you know, I was, I've been praying, and, and like I said, God laid this message on my heart, and he told me, he said, Cindy, he said, I want you to, uh, you're going to bring this message to Eastside Community Church. How many of y'all is tight? How many of y'all have been battling allergies? I don't know about you, but I know my husband and I, when, especially my husband, that when the allergy season comes and ragweed is his, his nemesis, he, gets in, he goes into a depression. How many, now I'm not going to make you raise your hand on this, but I want you to think, how many of y'all are having issues in your family? I bet if I asked you to raise your hand, all of us could raise our hand because every family has them. You know, when, when, when God laid this on my heart, and I'm going to be reading from John chapter 5. When God laid this on my heart, I went to pastor, and I said, Pastor, God's given me a message. It's a healing message. And I thought, now I have, I have preached this message before in different places, and I thought I would just do the same routine thing that I always did with this message. But isn't God wonderful? Because he always changes it up on you when you get too comfortable. And trust me, I woke up this morning, and I am more nervous right now than I have been in a long time. So y'all bear with me because I know God wants to. How many believe that God is still in the miracle business? How many believe that God is still God on the throne? Oh, I tell you what, I'm, now I'm going to tell y'all, I'm going to get excited because just studying this. Oh, God has stirred up inside of me because he has let me know and he's wanting to let you know that God's not dead. You know, the pastor said that not, well, I think it was last Sunday or maybe the Sunday before, but if you've noticed, a lot of his sermons has been leading right up to today. Because I believe that here today in Muskogee, Oklahoma, in 2021, that God wants to break out right here in Eastside Community Church. I believe that. And I believe that miracles are going to happen. You know, we, when we talk about miracles, we, we automatically think of Jesus healing the blind and Jesus healing the lame that couldn't walk and Jesus raising the dead. But then you look at me and you say, well, Sister Cindy, that was all back in Jesus' time. When Jesus was here on earth, well, let me tell you something. Jesus is still on earth, and he dwells inside of me. He dwells inside of you, and he is here, and he is still wanting to do miracles. My Bible tells me that my God does not change. What he did yesterday, he can do today. And what he did in John chapter 5, verse 1, I'm going to read verse 1 through 9, and then we're going to break this down. And I will explain to you later why God had me dressed this way. So y'all bear with me. One thing. When I walked up here, I caught everybody's attention. So you may be someone who doesn't really pay attention when the preacher's preaching, but you're going to look at me and you're going to watch me because you want to see what I'm going to do next. But John chapter 5, verse 1, says, And after, there, after this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep's gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the movement of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time to the pool and stirred up the waters. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man was there who had had an, an infirmity 38 years. 
And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? I'm going to read that last line again. Jesus said, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another one steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately, it didn't say in a week. It didn't say in six months. It said, and immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Well, guess what? Y'all are in luck. Because what is today? Today is the Sabbath. You know, Jesus, when he walked, he, that's one thing that really, he really could get under the skin of all the Pharisees and all the Sadducees and all of the religious leaders because he didn't care what day it was. If his father told him to do it, he did it. And I want to ask you this question today. The same question that Jesus asked this man. Do you, put your name in there, want to be made well? Ponder that. Ponder that question because we're going to break it down. In verse 5, because I want to start, well, first I want to tell you that, that the, the, I was doing some, you know, I, I'm not really a historian person. I'm not real crazy. I hated history in, in, in school. <laughs> but when I, but when, I, uh, when I was reading this, I thought, the sheep's gate. I've heard things about the sheep's gate. So I went into digging. I wanted to see what I could. I couldn't remember what I had heard, but I knew somebody had said something about the Sheep's Gate. And this is what I learned. The Sheep's Gate was a gate that was kind of off to the side. It wasn't the main gate that everybody come in. But it's where they would bring in the sacrificial lambs. Think about that. And it, was, it is believed that this is the gate that Jesus just entered into. By the pool of Bethesda. You want to know what Bethesda means? House of mercy, yes. House of mercy. Think about that. Friends, we are living in the house of mercy. I want a Bethesda experience. I want to be in the house of mercy. I want to be made well. And you know, when we talk about being made well, we think automatically, again, back to cancer, coronavirus. Yeah, that's that dirty word we hate these days. Or we think about our children having a bellyache. Or we think about Alzheimer's. We think about all of these diseases. We think about AIDS. Yes, I said it, because it's very real. We think about these things, but did you know that there is more diseases than just that? Because today I believe God wants to talk to you not only about the physical, but you know, I'm not a nurse. Everybody knows I am not a nurse. And probably if some of, luckily my sister's not here today, and Amy is in the nursery, and Sister Rebecca's not here, and I don't see Sister Sydney, so I won't get condemned today. I won't get stoned today. But you know, when God asked me to dress like this, now, just because I'm telling you why I'm dressed like this, don't turn me off, okay? Because when God said, I want you to get on Amazon and order a nurse's hat, and I want you to wear it when you preach, I said, God, a nurse's hat? Yep. And I have a white dress, it's sad to say, hanging in my closet, which I was going to wear. That was going to be my, because I wanted to bring across the old nurse. But when I tried it on, 
you know, I like, to, I like chocolate too well. So it didn't fit. So Lena helped me, and we, we got together a scrub, and I hid it because I didn't want to be up here singing praise because if I walked in and everybody see me, I'd say, why is she wearing scrub on Sunday when she's going to be on stage? Well, you know, so I hid it under my skirt. And the reason God wanted me to dress like this because he wants, because what does a nurse do? A nurse works for the doctor. The nurse is usually the first person you see. And the nurse is the one who takes your temperature and all your vitals, and you tell her what your problems are. I am not asking you to tell me what your problems are. That was not part of this plan. But I will listen if you need someone to listen. But the nurse is then the one who goes back, and before the doctor ever walks in the room, she relays to the doctor of why you're there. Is this not true? And God told me that today, I am supposed to be nurse to Eastside Community. I am supposed to, and like I said, I'm not asking to hear your problems, but I will pray for you. I will pray with you. But the nurse is also, if you notice, the doctor will come in, spend two or three minutes with you, and then he walks out. And then the nurse comes back in, right? And what does she do then? Well, this is what the doctor said. She says it in layman terms because when he tells you, you don't understand a word he says because you don't have a medical degree. But she comes in, she says, this is what the doctor, he wants you to take this medicine or he wants you to do this or he wants you to do that. And if you have any problems, feel free to call us. And she sends you on your way, right? So she's the first one you see and the last one you see. And God told me, he said, I want you to dress like a nurse because I want the people to know that I have nurses all over the world. And I don't work for a doctor's office. In fact, I work for Fort Gibson Public Schools. I'm a bus driver, the farthest thing from being a nurse. But, you know, I don't have to have a nursing degree. Pastor, I don't have to have any kind of degree. If God called me, I work for the great physician. And the great physician wants you to know he's in the office. And he wants you to know that this nurse does not have to be the first person you see and the last person you see. Because the great physician makes house calls. The great physician, he is there when you need him the most. He, is, he never leaves your side. The Bible says that God told us that, lo, I am with you always. He is telling you no matter what you're going through, I'm right there. He tells us that we don't have to fight those battles, that he is fighting our battles for us. But he still asks you this question. See, y'all thought I was chasing rabbits, didn't you? Do you want to be made well? In verse 5, the Bible says that this man had been there for 38 years. Can you imagine laying there at this pool for 38 years, not being able to walk? And knowing that at a certain time, at a certain appointed time, God sends that angel down and you see the waters bubbling and you know that the healing is in those waters and you try your best to go and you, you start to crawl in there. But, the, you know, the rules of the pool is, because every pool has a rule, the rules of the pool is the first ones in are the ones who get the healing. Oh, think about that. Brother Mike, what if it was the first ones up here? are the only ones who could get healed. How many of us would miss out on a healing? Just like this man, 38 years he laid there, and he was not able to move. He was sick. He was not able to put himself in. And it doesn't matter how, how long you have been sick, and I use my air quotations for that, because I'm not talking about <laughs> sick. I'm talking about sick, whether it is physical, whether it's mental. Are you depressed? How many, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but think about How many of you are, are battling depression? Let me tell you all something. When I got, when Pastor Gary come and told me, he said, now i got two weeks, then I'm going to be finishing up my series, and I'm going to let you preach. Almost from the moment he told me that, depression come upon me. And I'm like, God, now I'm just going to breathe real with you, okay? Can I be real with you? And I said, God, I know what you have told me to, to bring to the people. 
But how can I, you hear what I said, how can I stand before this congregation battling depression and tell them that you are here to heal their depression? And this morning, and, and I, how many's had a rough week? Raise your hand on that one. I have had a very rough week, and I'm not up here to get sympathy. I want you to know this is how things work because I knew the closer, the closer to Sunday we got, the more Satan battled me. And let me tell you all something. Satan is a real thing. We, the Bible tells us that we fight against principalities and things that we do not see that is not of this world. And let me tell you something, it's very real. And if you are on the verge, if you are doing what God said to do, let me tell you something, that's where your anxiety comes from. That's where your depression comes from. That's where your I don't want to's come from. That's where you say, where you, nobody cares. I just, and I, and I will tell you, I honestly said at one point in these last two weeks, I just don't feel I feel like a failure. I don't feel worthy. I have said that in the last two weeks. But you know what? I did, I did not let that stop me. I did not let that stop me. I still got on my knees, Brother Mike. I still opened my Bible, and I still went to John chapter 5, verse 1 through 9, and God said, I will heal you. Now, how can you tell these people? Because I'm going to heal you. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. And I tell you, I'm feeling it. If you don't feel it, you come on up here. I'll turn around this way and preach at you. I'll tell you what, because the Bible tells us Jesus, he looked. I like that because when I read verse 6, it said, and Jesus saw him. Do you know how many people, how many has been to a concert? Now, everybody probably should raise, how many has been to a football game? How many have been in a big gathering? And you look around. I tell you, I've been to a few concerts. And then I looked around when, because we're usually we're up way up in the in the air, you know, because that's all we can afford. But it, it doesn't matter. But you know, I, I look around. Sometimes I catch myself, Brother Mike, looking around at all the people, and I feel like nothing. I'm just a speck. That person or those that group that I love to see or hear to sing or whatever the concert may be, that person, I'm there to see them. But you know what? They have no clue that I'm sitting up there in the nosebleed section. But I can walk in to a mega church. And listen to where I'm going with this, guys. I can walk in. I love to watch Franklin Jensen. He's one of my favorites. And if you ever, I mean, he preaches, his sermons go out to several campuses on a Sunday, which that's, it doesn't matter. But if you ever watched when they pan in his freedom chapel that they're in, the free chapel, I'm like, whoo, there's no way that he knows every one of those people. But let me tell you something. I could walk into a mega church like that. And the minute I sit down, no matter where I sit, no matter if anybody comes up and talks to me, God saw me. God saw me sit down. God saw me walk into his house. And it doesn't matter. I'm not here to impress anybody. I'm here because God sees me. And Jesus saw him. All these people laying around, Jesus saw him. And let me tell you something, when Jesus sees us hurting, when Jesus sees us sick physically, when Jesus sees us struggling or stumbling through life, he sees us in every situation that we're in. He sees us when we're driving down the road. And I, like I said, I want to be real with you. I told you this the last two weeks I've been in a depression. I haven't been in this kind of depression since I was a teenager. A teenager. As a teenager, I used to get into these where I would just cry for days. And it drove my parents nuts because they would come and ask me, well, what's the matter with you? I don't know. Well, why are you crying? I don't know. Have you ever been there? The other day, I, was, I had gotten off of the bus. I had McKenzie in the back seat. I had turned the radio off because I was just at the point. I didn't want to hear nothing. And I was on my way home, and I got... Oh, probably about midway. And the tears just started flowing. And I was like, why am I crying? This is ridiculous. Why am I crying? 
And God spoke to me. He said, because I see you. I know where you're at. Your heart is broken and you don't know why. You're struggling and you don't know why, but I see you. And it uplifted me. And I, 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 I look and I think, God, you want to make us well. But let me tell you something. Again, I want to ask you the question. Do you want to be made well? And let me tell you something. Just because you're sitting right here in Eastside community doesn't mean you're going to walk out of here made well. Because let me tell you something about my God. My God is a loving God. And he wants to, oh, he is, you know, if ever y'all ever watch a horse race or dog races, I tell you what, I've, I have been to some, I'll be honest, but you watch them. If you're up close to where the gates are, or even watch a NASCAR on TV, if you watch them, when, the, when that, that pace car, when he goes off on pit row, oh, how many of them? That's when you get a lot of the good accidents because they all start jumping the gun trying to get. Well, let me tell you something. That's what God is doing right now. He's up there, and he sees you. He sees you, and he's up there, and he's just ready, and he just came. And if you watch a horses when they're racing or whatever that you see them, they're trying to get out of that gate because they know they're waiting on that bell. Well, let me tell you something. My God does not force himself on anybody. And he looked at that man. He, you know, he could have just walked right up to that man and touched him, and the man could have got right up. But he didn't. He said, do you want to be made? He had a choice to make. Friend, God, he's telling us, I see you, and I want to make you well. Proverbs 15, 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. He sees us no matter what we're doing. Psalms 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their cry. Jeremiah 23, 4. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so that I shall not see him? Says the Lord, do I not feel heaven and earth, says the Lord? He sees us. He sees us. Verse 7. The man answered him. After he asked him, do you want to be made well? And the man looked at him. And he said, I don't have anybody. No one. No man. No woman. No child. No one is here to put me in the pool. Think about what he said. No one. I have no one. Two Many times we rely on man or ourselves. Because he says, even though I try, somebody steps in before me. So he says, I have no one. And like I said earlier, Jesus will not force himself on you. And you know, so many times in the troubles that we are having in our lives, we want to depend on somebody. And I'm not saying that it's not. I have people I go and talk to. I talk to my husband, and we, we discuss things. We fuss over things. I mean, we're normal. Sometimes I can go and I can talk to our pastor, and it makes me feel better. I have friends. I have girlfriends that I can call up and say, hey, can I talk to you about this situation? I just need fresh ears. I just need somebody. I need an outside looking in to tell me. But you know what? So many times, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we cannot rely on man alone. Because man is going to cause, he's, he's going to fall at some point. But he says, I have no one. And we need to, dis we need to see that our only hope that we have is to turn to Jesus. In Psalms chapter 121, verse 1 and 2 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Psalms 54, 4a says, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. Isaiah 41, 13 says, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not. I will help you. 
verse 7 says, while I am, so Jesus, he's letting us know that our help comes from God alone. We, we depend too much on man, and we need to start depending some on God. In verse 7, he's, he finished it up. He says that while I'm coming, someone gets in front of me. So many times I have seen that people will be praying and praying and praying, and, and, we'll, and we'll know, we'll just feel like God's going to bless us, and then we'll see that our neighbor gets blessed. And the first thing we think, well, God never blesses me. Well, they got, they got the blessing I was supposed to get. Because maybe they got the same thing that you've been praying for. But let me tell you something. We need to stop looking at what's going on around us and keep our eyes on Jesus. Because he's the one that's asking us, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Verse 8. Jesus looked at him. And he told him. To rise up. Oh, I tell you, when, when I was feeling this, when I was reading this, God told, I felt it. He said, rise up. Rise up. You know, so many times we'll sit and we'll cower down because we get scared. We cower down because we think that, that we have been defeated. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus is here, and he is wanting to stir the waters. This is stirred up here. I don't know if y'all can feel it or not, but I know when we were singing, and I can feel it now that the waters are stirred. You know, usually I have a little swimming pool up here with water in it. And, I, and you know, but it, this time God told me to dress like a nurse because he wants you to know that he has people out there in your pathway that is there to help you. They're there to listen to you. They're there to get on their knees. You know, everybody needs a good friend that will get on their knees and pray with you about things because a prayer partner is what helps us get through this. But Jesus said to him, rise up. I believe that today the message God is trying to tell us is to rise up. Get out of that self-pity. Get out of that depression. And Trust me, I know depression is real. I know this. And I know it's a hard thing. But you know what? As long as you're sitting there and you are not trying to, to get yourself out of it, if you're not searching the word and asking God to come and heal you and to raise you up, then you are not rising up to the occasion. You are not rising up and believing that God can make you well. If you are struggling with addiction, see, that's something we don't want to talk about. Because we don't want to offend nobody. Well, let me tell you something. If you get offended, I'm sorry for myself, but I'm not sorry because God wants you to know he can heal you from addiction. There are people that I'm not saying that right here in this church, but there are people sitting in church houses all over the place today that is addicted to drugs. There are people who is addicted to alcohol. And I'm going to say this. There are people who are addicted to porn and nobody knows it. And you are, there are people who are addicted to their wives or addicted to their husbands. You say, how can I be that? Because if you put it, if you've just got to be with them or you have just got to be, and it's got to be right above God and you can't do with it. And I'm, I feel like y'all are misunderstanding what I'm saying, but if an addiction is something you cannot live without. You know, we ought to have an addiction to Jesus. We ought to grab a hold of our Bibles, and we ought to search him every day. That ought to be something that, that should, that's just something we should do, because that is one addiction that will help you throughout all the others. But, you know, we don't want to talk about addiction. We don't want people to know that I'm addicted to porn. And we don't want people to know that I'm an alcoholic. We don't want people to know that I'm a drug addict. We don't want people to know that I'm addicted to stealing things. Because it, I, they look so highly at me. Well, let me tell you something. God sees you. God sees in the secret parts of your heart that no one else knows. God sees the things that even your spouse may not know. God sees the things that your pastor does not know. God sees the things that your children may not know that you did before you had them. God sees everything you have done from the day you were born till the day you die. God sees it. And let me tell you something, there is a record of it. You know, you don't go to the doctor without them writing down a record. You don't go to the doctor without them writing down that you were in there for an ingrown toenail. And you don't, you don't go to the doctor without them writing it down that you were there because you thought you had corona and it was just allergies. 
There's a record of everything you've done. But when God sees you and when we quit depending on man and when we decide that we're going to get addicted to Jesus and we're going to get into the Word, all of that can be erased. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that He removes all of our sins as far as the east is from the west. And all we have to do is reach out and say, Yes, Lord, I want to be made well. Yes, Lord, I want to rise up. I want to pick up this pity party that I'm in and I want to sling it back back to hell where it belongs. I want Satan to get off of my back and the only way it's going to happen is if I back up, Lord, and let you go before me and fight those battles. Do you want to be made well? I told you I get excited. and I'm sorry, but you know what? God excites me. I tell you what, when I think about the things that God has done for me, when I think about the things that God's going to do for me, when I think about things that God can do for you, I get excited for you. And I'm like, if you would just quit being that man sitting down on the porch and waiting for somebody else to come and lift you up and put you in that pool, what you have to do is you have to let God see you. You have, And I'm not saying you don't have to make all kinds. You don't have to be the best singer in church. You don't have to be the best drummer in church you don't have to be a piano player you don't have to be the cook you don't have to be the one who washes the toilets in the church it doesn't matter what you do because if you will just open up God sees you and he's asking you do you want to be made well you know what he's looking at us to every one of you that's sitting here today he's looking at you and he sees he sees the sickness that you have Oh, somebody just pulled back. I don't have a sickness. Yes, you do. You're human. How many aliens have we got sitting in here? How many outer space men do we have in here? But you know what? Even if you're from outer space, it don't matter. Because God owns outer space too. If you're human, you have a sickness of some sort. We have hang-ups. Okay, all right, I won't call it a sickness, okay, guys? We have hang-ups. Well, that just offends me. Well, you know, Grandma Mary taught me that this is the way it is. Well, let me tell you something. I'm not dishing nobody's grandma. But if you don't find what Grandma Mary said in the Bible then you better disregard what Grandma Mary said about whatever it is. Because let me tell you something. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new. And we need to open up and let God see us. We need to answer Jesus' question. The man, and not like the man did. The man said, well, I don't have nobody. I don't have nobody. But when he was willing to open up, when he was willing to open up his heart and let all the ugliness shine through. You don't have to show me your ugliness. My heart's just as ugly as yours. If I could sit here and tell you, and I'm not going to because it's none of your business, because it's between me and God, because it's already been covered by the blood. But if I told you some of the things that I have done, y'all would say, I don't even know why you're in church. But see, that's the problem. We like to get in our pool Remember I said earlier that pools have rules? Well, we like to come in those doors right there and enter into our own pool. And we like to sit down and splash around a little bit. We want to kind of throw the water on somebody else. You know, my mom was deathly afraid. She would take a shower or a bath, but when we went swimming, she would get out to her ankles, and that was as far as that woman would go. And you know, kids, you didn't splash her or you got in some serious trouble. But we always did. We always did. But you know, that's what we want to do. We want to splash. Oh, Brother Mike, I see this is in your life, so I'm going to splash it on you. Because while we're splashing on somebody else, we're not looking at what's in here. But Jesus saw, Jesus sees, 
He knows exactly how ugly our hearts are. And then when we open up our ugly hearts and let him come in and let him speak to us, and he's telling you the same thing he told this man when the man said, okay, God, I don't have nobody to put me in, but I'm willing and waiting. I'm ready for you to heal me. I'm tired. You know, he could have sat there because, you know, what if it would have been these days, he could have sat there and drawn a check right off the government. He could have sat there and said, well, if I let God heal me, oh, I'll lose my check. I might have to get out and find a job then. If I let God heal me, my wife won't feel sorry for me no more. If I let God heal me, what am I going to hold over my children's head? That's why we're sitting there because we don't want God to heal us because it's so too much to give up. But you know what? This man, he could have sat there and said, you know what? I've been sitting here for 38 years. I can just sit here for another 38. I might, have, I might every time the angel comes, I'll scoot a little bit closer. And then the next time, because it doesn't say how long in between it was. But then the next time he comes and stirs up, I'll inch a little closer. Some of us are just, we're just inching. We're just inching. Pastor Gary, we don't want to get in fully. We just want to inch our way in. Oh, this water's cold, so I'm just going to take my time, and I'm going to tiptoe into the water. When you might as well just jump in and get it over with. But this man looked at Jesus, and he, he said, Jesus seen his heart, and he knew he wanted to be made well. He wanted to be made whole, and Jesus said, rise. Rise. Jesus is telling us to stand up and claim the victory that is already ours. He is telling us. See, let me tell you something that, that God kind of brought to my mind. Jesus told the man, rise up and walk. If that man had chose not to, he'd have still sat there for 38 years not being able to walk. Because, again, like I told you, God doesn't force you to do anything. But Jesus said, rise up. And immediately, Jesus is telling us to rise up and claim the victory that he has set before us. He is telling us to rise up and claim the forgiveness that he has offered us when God offered his son on the cross. And Jesus spread his arms. You know, when he was in the garden, he, he did say, he said, God, Father, let this pass from me. He was in that human moment. He said, I don't want to do this. But all oh, the most beautiful thing happened because he said, God, he said, Father, take this away from me. I don't want to do this. This is too hard. How many times have we told God, God, I don't want to do this. This is too hard. I said, God, I don't want to dress like that. People's going to think I'm an idiot. Well, you know what? I may be an idiot, but I'm an idiot for God. But Jesus said, Father, let this pass from me. But, but, see, it's okay for us to sit and whine to God. It's okay for us to say, God, I don't want to do this. I do not want to do this. But. Jesus said, not my will, but your will, Father, to be done. And the most beautiful love story took place that day because Jesus, they didn't have to throw him on that cross. You know, I believe that when they brought those two, the, the two thieves that hung on either side of Jesus, I believe they were fighting and cussing and scratching all the way up the hill. But, you know, I know that the love that I feel when Jesus, when I read his word and I learn, I believe that Jesus walked every mile and he could see the people around him yelling and throwing rocks. And he, you know, he could have said, God, I have no man to help me. Even his own personal people, the ones who was closest to him, scattered. One gave him up with a kiss. One denied him three times. But yet, Jesus, I believe when he, he seen these, but he still loved them. And not only did he see those that was around him that day, I believe because I believe God knows exactly when the last day is. And I believe, Pastor, if there was a way that Jesus looked ahead on this date in 2021, and he said there's a church sitting in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and Gary Underwood's going to be there, and Mike Hedge is going to be there, and all, and all of the rest of you, I'm not going to call everybody's name, but he's sitting there looking, and he says, you are, because I see faces that I, 
I have not seen in the church. I'm not saying you haven't been here, but I haven't seen you. But I'm seeing faces today that you. this may be your first Sunday. And I believe God looked ahead. Jesus looked ahead in time and said, this person's going to be sitting in that little church down there in Muskogee, Oklahoma at Eastside Community Church. And they're going to hear that weirdo up there dressed like a nurse that's saying, do you want to be made well? And he, Jesus says, I'm going to crawl on this cross and I'm going to spread my arms as far as I can because that's how how far I'm going to remove your sickness and I want to do this for you because I want to make you well. God loves you. God loves you and he wants us to rise up like the people he has called us. He wants us to raise up and you know not to rise up in, in a great victory of ourselves. He wants us to rise up and let people know. The Bible says that this man rose up and he went and he showed himself. He let people know that God raised him up. That he wants us to grasp the forgiveness that he's offering and he's telling us this is one thing that God brought to my mind, and I certainly want to make sure I bring it to you. It is not too late. That man laid there for 38 years. He probably thought that he was going to be there till he died. But you know what? It was not too late because Jesus saw him. It is not too late, and no one, no one has taken your blessing no one has taken your healing, and no one has taken your deliverance. It's yours. It's got your name on it, and it won't fit me, and it won't fit somebody else. It's God has it prepared for you. And let me tell you something. I, I look and I see that, the, that God is offering all of this. And you want to know what the price is? The price is shipping is free. The price is, the price has been paid because the price is life. The price is the blood of the lamb. But you know what? The lamb died a long time ago so you and I wouldn't have to. The lamb chose to heal us. He came and he walked among the people of this earth and he wanted, to, he wants you to know he's telling you to rise up because the victory is yours. 1 Corinthians says, but thanks to be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. For, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9 says, we are hard pressed on every side. How many are hard pressed on every side? I tell you, sometimes it feels like it's just coming everywhere. It says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despair. Persecuted. Because you're going to be persecuted when you take that stand. But you know what? You're not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Oh, you may have times that you fall. But you are not destroyed, brothers and sisters. God, is, Jesus is saying, rise up. Take up that bed of self-pity. Take up that bed that you're laying in. And you walk out of here with your head held high. Because I have given you the victory. 1 John 4, 4 says... You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. What are we talking about them? The things that goes on in this world, things that comes against us. It says, because he who is in you, who is he? Jesus. He who is in you is greater than he. Who is he in the world? Satan. That means you are an overcomer. You have already, you may not feel like it, but you got to rise up and pick up that bed and you need to start walking in that victory. Romans 8. I want to read this to you because this is, when I read, I have to read the whole thing because God spoke to me so much. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39, and, and I'm almost done. I promise I am almost done, believe it or not. Romans 8, 31. It says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, it may seem like the whole world is against us. But if God is for us, we will not be defeated. He who did not spare his own son. Now see, I'm just showing you that what I just told you a minute ago is Bible. It says, but delivered him up for us all. 
It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, Indian, Chinese, pink or purple. It doesn't matter. Because he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. God's the only one that you have to worry about. It says, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. I like that. I like that because we didn't leave him on the cross. It said he died, but furthermore, he is risen. And he is even at the right hand of God. I like this. Who also makes intercession for us. You are not alone. You are victorious because Jesus sees you. And when he sees you struggling, he automatically walks into the Father's room. And he says, look, look, Father. I've got somebody down there that's struggling. I want to plead for them. I got somebody who has went back into that addiction. Father, I, I want to stand before you and plead their case. Because God, Father, I know they may have failed, but I know that there's still hope. Let me go down and ask them, do you want to be made well? We hang our heads in shame when, when, we, when we go back to the old ways, the old man that we had before Jesus came in. We get we get all messed up and inside, and, and we and, and let me tell you something. I have seen several, I have seen several, and especially, I don't know if it's true, but I've heard it said, and, I, and what I have seen, I believe is true. But you take a preacher who has failed and has turned his back on God for a period of time. There's no one worse, because they feel that they are unworthy for the forgiveness the second time. Let me tell you something. My Bible tells me that God loves us. And I'm not opening up a loophole. We're not going to court over this thing, saying, well, I can do this because Cindy said, no, I am not. But if you, you stumble and you fall, you turn yourself back around. And you say, God, forgive me. Forgive me because I want to be back in your presence. But it says that he makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet. And all these, I tell you, when you read the Bible, you gotta, you got to love all the yets and the buts. Because when you hear a yet, or you hear the word but, you know something good's fixing to come around, or something bad. But if Jesus is talking, or if they're talking about Jesus, it's going to be something good. It says, but yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Yes, that ought to make us all shout. That means that we're not down for the count. That means Satan may have us on the mat, and, he may, and the, the referee may be down there, and he may be counting down, and he may be there at number nine, but you are not out because the Bible says right there, no matter what, we are still we are overcomers, and we cannot be conquered. It says we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor any other cre created thing shall be able to separate us 
from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. I tell you, that ought to make the church shout beyond where everybody downtown will hear us because that is some good news, people. Let me tell you, why did Jesus look at the man and say, do you want to be made well? Why did he look at him and say, rise up victorious and walk in me and walk upright? You know, we don't have to walk around as Christians. Lord, don't make me say this. We don't have to walk around as Christians looking like we just drank the whole jar of pickle juice. We don't have to walk around. You know, my husband likes to watch westerns, old westerns. And I've noticed in every little western town, there's Bertha that walks around in front of the saloon. And when the girls come out that work in the saloon, she looks down at them. She might pull her little glasses down like that. But you know what? We don't have to walk around in shame because God has given us victory. God has made us victorious. And immediately the man was made well. Today, I want to ask.